So tourist guides from across the globe. I think we have 85 countries joining us today. So welcome and thank you for taking the time to visit us and join us for this mini virtual conference. I'm Alishka Ritchie. I'm president of the World Federation of Tourist Guide Associations. And for those who are new to the World Federation of Tourist Guide Associations, we are an international organization with full member associations, affiliates and individual members. We advocate for our profession in different ways. We have an executive board, some of whom you'll meet later today, as well as a training division with WFTGA trainers spread across many countries. We've had a very interesting year, a tough year, and today's short virtual conference is all about showcasing some positive opportunities and ways to move forward, starting with our guest speaker, Professor Corin Harris. Thereafter, we will introduce you to International Tourist Guide Day. So International Tourist Guide Day is the one day a year which is dedicated to us, the tourist guide and our profession. Then of course, we're all looking forward to the day we can meet in person. And with our international convention taking place in February next year, we hope to see all of you. We will introduce you to our international convention, our hosts, and explain what all, all of this is about. We then welcome our strategic partners, the World Food Travel Association, where Eric will speak to us about some specific tourist guide opportunities. And to end, we will open the connection rooms. These four rooms have a specific topic each open for discussion where it will be very interactive and you'll be able to speak and connect with colleagues on the specific topics presented. But more about those at the end of the mini virtual conference. We are absolutely delighted to have with us today, Professor Karen Harris. Some of you may remember Professor Harris from our Tbilisi Convention in 2019, where she gave a very interesting presentation as one of our keynote speakers. Professor Harris is a full professor in the Department of Historical and Heritage Studies at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. She lectures both undergraduate and postgraduate students in history, as well as heritage and cultural studies in tourism. And of course, Professor Harris is an accredited cultural tourist guide in South Africa and is one of the WFTGA family. So Professor Harris, welcome. We are looking forward to hearing your presentation today and I hand over to you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much for the invitation, Rushka. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'll just share my screen with you. Right, thank you very much. And a warm welcome from a very warm South Africa to all the people that I met in Tbilisi already two years ago. And to those of you I haven't, I look forward to meeting you next year when we meet in Serbia. So Elushka approached me and said to me, would I please present? And of course, I'm a sucker for punishment. I said, of course. And she said to me, but keep it positive. And of course, in these times, I think in the tourist guiding game, that is what we need. So I came up with a paper, which you're probably all wondering, what am I on about? Doubling up tourism in times of trouble, the COVID survival strategy. Right, um, Elushka's already given you a little bit of background on where I come from, but just so that you can get an idea, um, I am in South Africa, the bottom end of Africa, I'm in the Gauteng province and I'm in the capital city, Pretoria. The screen also depicts a beautiful picture of our university, the University of Pretoria. And as Alushka pointed out, I'm also an accredited tourist guide. Um, I got into the tourist game some 25 years ago, a quarter century ago, um, as part of one of the first universities in South Africa where humanities department was, was teaching and presenting heritage and cultural tourism. Tourism has always been the domain of the economics faculties, but we started a program in our department. And I'm very proud and glad to say that we have some of the um, only postgraduate students in the country, and we have an undergraduate and a postgraduate um, course. So that then is a little bit about me. This is also a welcome from our campus to show you in the next weeks, we will be known as the Jacaranda City or the Purple City. And this is a picture showing you our beautiful picturesque 
um, university. And you'll understand why I'm pointing to this as we move forward. So my paper is divided into two parts. The one is the wicked problem and the other is doubling up on tourism. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a wicked problem is a social or cultural problem that's difficult or impossible to solve. And I think for many in the tourism sector, this is exactly what the situation is. And the reason that the problem is difficult to solve is because it's complex and it's interconnected. Wicked problems also lack clarity in both their aims and solutions and are also subject to real world constraints which hinder risk-free attempts to find a solution. And this has been the story of tourism 2020 and going into 2021. Here you will see it's a complex situation and it is not, and, and the, the problems are interconnected. And for those of you at Tbilisi, I used this image to explain where I saw the tourist guide at being at the epicenter of the tourism business. But in this portrayal, I'm showing the COVID virus coming in and like a detonator destroying everything that is absolutely essential to the tourism game. So this is the real world constraints that we're having to deal with. Um, and so we now have to come up with some kind of solution. Now, here's my wicked part. We all know the toil and trouble of William Shakespeare um, and his wonderful song that has been for many years um, displayed and, and read at schools. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. The less harvest Benny snake in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog. Adler's fork and blind worm sting, lizard's leg and howler sting, for a charm of power for trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble. But let us move on. I have prepared for you our double double toil and trouble. And in this version, I am adapting Shakespeare, with all due respect, to double double tourism in trouble. Double double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. COVID virus live doth take, tourism declining in its wake, borders closed and flights grounded, faces masked and tourism floundered. Tourists not going anywhere, stay at home and just despair. Bubbling tourism in times of trouble, tourism will get over this hubble. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Never mind this hocus pocus, tourism will emerge with new focus. As we know, the pandemic was said to cost the tourism industry some $1 trillion. The decline was phenomenal and it did not get better as we moved through the year 2020 into 2021. Here you can see on this global map that the average down or plummet was 72% across the globe and tourism was really in dire straits. Bad to worse, in early 2021, these figures got worse. And if we look at the UN World Tourism Organization statistics, it really is not a pretty picture. Moreover, there were five ways that were identified that COVID had changed how the world and how and where people could move. And because tourism is so integral to movement, this was a hard knock to handle. The World Health Organization said that by March 2020, 348 countries had closed either partially or completely. 189 countries had stopped foreign travelers from entering. That is 65% of the world population. And 98 countries had, had targeted entries by both land and sea. Very differently for what we normally see, the United States of American citizens were barred from entering 190 countries. And being one of the uh, feeders to much of the tourism industry, this was of course another blow. And then visa seekers and immigrants were banned in the United States of America. So if we have a look at this map, you can see the 189 countries where the pandemic had impacted, which as I said, this was roughly 65% of the world population was closed to land, sea and airports of entry to their countries. And this total closure on every continent of the world really impacted badly on the tourism. It is indeed a wicked problem. These were the kinds of scenes, empty airports and roads closed due to the COVID-19. And so traveling was a no-no. The world paused and many people saw this as an opportunity to rethink and to reconfigure. Um, and here on the screen, I've given you just a sampling of some of the international logos that came out. 
bringing Britain to you and be safe, stay at home from Switzerland, dream now and visit later. We are the greatest coincidence. And so countries try to come to terms with what had happened. South Africa, our South African Tourism Board went for don't travel now, so you can travel later. Academia, as well as the popular media, did a thousand examples of how and what was to happen. COVID-19 would set the global tourism economy back by 20 years. COVID was a travel, the, the COVID-19 travel shock hit tourism dependent economies hard across the globe, nobody was spared. And so people both in academia and in the industry and in the social media started looking at ways of how were we going to turn this around? What were we going to do? And from a very brief looking at all of these, you'll see there's a repetition of a number of words that come through. The OECD, for example, was saying that we need to restore traveler confidence. We need to support tourism businesses. We need to adapt. We must promote domestic tourism. We must provide clear information to travelers. And we need to rebuild tourism competitiveness. The whole idea of response, recovery, resilience. And so I call it the R factor. If you look at it, it's kind of all over the place. Reconsider, redesign, revolutionize, reignite the industry, reinvigorate and reconfigure. But all roads led to domestic tourism. Because we were shut down, because we had lockdown, because borders were closed, domestic tourism was the place we had to turn to. And perhaps it wasn't a bad idea. Perhaps it wasn't a bad thing that we started looking in our own backyards and started to see what there was for us to tap into in order to turn this terrible scourge around. In an article written by a professor Ishmael Mensah of the University of the Cape Coast, um, which focused specifically on unpacking the impacts of COVID-19 um, in the hotel industry, he took the words COVID and put it together for us. Cost cutting, orderliness, virtualization, integration, and then finally domestication, tapping into our domestic market. So you would see many of your travel journals and, and um, Facebook pages and the like, we're talking about how international travel has been shut down, but the industry must now turn to the domestic tourism market as a lifeline and the way to recovery. But that's all very well. We now focus on domestic tourism, but how do we double up tourism? And now I move on to the next part of my paper, which is going to look at ways and means, suggestions and possibilities for what we can do to the domestic market. I want to take you back to one of the very first academics who published on the tourism sector and a framework of the tourism sector way back in 1979. Some of us remember those years. The Annals of Tourism Research um, produced this article, the framework of tourism towards a definition of tourism, tourist and the tourist industry. And I must say, ladies and gentlemen, there are many things that are tried and tested. We think of the Butler model and many others that have stood the test of time. And on the screen there, you will see I'm sharing the image from life. And in fact, I have a doctoral student who's just worked with this as well and used it in a new dimension. But I'm taking this very thing to look at the components of the tourist industry. We have the tourist, we then have that transit journey, and we then have the destination. So keep it simple. That is what it all entails. And how do we now take these components and do something different with them? So when we look at the tourist, you will notice the, the demographics here. And this is done, um, a, a, a survey that was done across Europe. We look at the Netherlands, Italy, Spain, France, Germany, and the UK. And it indicates the difference between female and male, but it also looks at the age differences. As you will notice, the obviously the three to 17 year old age is, is the least group of travelers. But when we go from 35 to 64, that is where the bulk of people are, are traveling. And it's important that we understand this in order to reinvigorate and to R, to rev the whole place up. Your people over 65, a limited number of people, that is a market that we need to tap into. We need to look at what can we do with the over 65s and see how they can be brought into this industry. So we need to reconfigure and relook at tourist dimension. This graph also gives us an indication of age group. And what is interesting here is a 2019 snapshot of the blue bars indicating to people who are participating in tourism and the orange people who are not. And that's the market we need to go and look at. 
Why are these people not traveling? What is preventing them? And how do we turn around that dimension? We have then the EU population here, ages 15 and over participating in tourism. And here, this discrepancy between the three colors is the domestic tourism market, the bottom part of the bar, then domestic and outbound um, combined, and then outbound only. And this gives you then a, a, a survey of what is happening in Europe at the time as well to see how the um, travel, what the travel market's looking at. I would suggest that we need to get away from the conventional tourists, that body who have always been traveling. They're welcome, and of course, we will keep tapping into them, but we need to look at a new tourist, the tourist who hasn't got that income to spend, and how do we get that um, individual into the game at a viable level? Even thinking of your business tourist, it's always your high echelon, people in the industry. But what about the informal people in the informal sector? These people also need to be pulled into the tourism game. And so there's another component that we need to be looking at. And then of course, the older bracket that we see on both graphs who are not traveling. How do we get them on board? How do we excite them about traveling? Here you will see a, a indication of the transport. Now, almost 60% of international travel is done by air, obviously. Then we have road and then across the seas and very limited on trains. We need to see that road is escalated here um, because that then is something in your domestic market and again will allow people who are usually outside of the bracket of the tourist market to come in and participate. We all know this um, when we um, think of the international tourism market, we think of these countries and this is the rankings that, that we have. We have France, Spain, the US, China, Italy, Turkey, Mexico, Thailand, Germany, and United Kingdom in that order. And these are the international tourist arrivals that we are all aware of. We know that the, are these iconic places that they go to visit. I mean, it's France, you have to go to the Louvre, you have to see the Mona Lisa. Spain, you have to go cruising down the Costa de Sol, you have to see the um, Eiffel Tower. These are the iconic draw cards. And this is what we sell our tourism game with. But I want us to rethink this. Do we only have to go to China to see the Great Wall or the Colosseum? Or do we only have to go to Turkey to see the Hagia Sophia? Yes, we do want to tick off our bucket list. We do want to do the things that are um, the draw cards. But I'm arguing that we need to go beyond that. We need to go to the back streets of France. We need to go to the rural territories in Spain. We need to go to the outback of the US. We need to go to those tiny little areas in, in rural China. We need to go to the villages in Italy, and we need to go to the hills in Turkey. We need to go off the mainstream, and we need to make the uniconic iconic in what we do in going forward. If we look at the um, graph here, which is looking at the destinations, you can see here, this was a forecast done way back in 2014, and it was indicating how international travel would take off in our dreams. This is something for the archives. It's not going to happen now. If we look at 2020, you can see that the domestic market really went up. And here again, I've, this graph very nicely indicates the generational difference of who's traveling when um, and where they're going. Um, and your international market is on the down. So this is the fruit for the picking. This is where we need to go. So to sum up, we need to link the local to the local. In transport, we need to tap into the affordable modes. In terms of a destination, we need to know places that were usually just stopovers, stops. We need to make the uniconic iconic. We, we really need to become hyper local. Ladies and gentlemen, I now turn right down to home, if I may. Um, Alusha, I still, I still have some time. Yes, um, yes, and I'm yes, going sorry. to do, thanks. I'm going to do a case study of the University of Pretoria where we have, as I mentioned earlier, um, a heritage and cultural tourism program. You do the degree in BSOCSKI um, honors and you can do the honors and then masters and doctorate. But my honors students are very close to my heart. And it was a course that I developed some 20 years ago, um, whereby instead of giving the students to go into internships within the industry, which was always problematic, we developed our own internship within the confines of our university. And so part of the EFK 754 module, my students, run what is known as UP campus tours. And I can assure you, this is a hard task. There's some of them watching today and they can attest to that. 
They designed their own presentation, Guiding in Diversity, Diversity the University of Pretoria Campus Tours. And this was the 2019 logo that was produced by the student body. The idea here is that they present tours on our campus, on our Hatfield campus, to prospective students, to visiting academics, and to new staff and school groups. So they devise tours which are researched in the archives, they do all the preparation, they do the running of visitor agency from the bookings to the answering of the calls to the running of the tours to making them interesting and to um, getting the money out of people, which is probably the most difficult task of all. So they get the hands on within our wonderful campus. They would take uh, the prospective students or the new uh, staff members or members of the public on the tours of our campus, which you can see is an architectural landscape, an absolute beauty um, in terms of a hundred years of history. Here you can see the different campus tour students engaging with different groups of students, whether it be tiny tots from primary schools to students who are coming to the university um, and more. This year, and last year, with campus tours being hit by COVID, I really had a headache. How was I going to give my students the experience that they needed? Lockdown did not allow anybody on campus and it's still restricted. And so they were going to be denied this incredible experience of having the hands on, having a year of experience before they launched into the industry. And so after a lot of thinking, we came up with a number of innovative ideas. And these are also ideas which show you how you can double up tourism. We no longer had prospective students. We no longer had the public. Nobody was visiting our university from overseas. And so we began virtual tours. Now, instead of just presenting a virtual tour where they made a video and you put it up and anybody can watch it at any time, our tours were interactive. So the student would then sit in the comfort of their home with their computer and they would connect to whoever else was on the other side. Could be a family, it could be a class that was being connected to virtually in their respective homes. It could be um, somebody overseas who was interested in the university. And in this particular case, this student is addressing some 400 engineering students across the country who are coming to the university the next year. And they can ask her questions as they move along. Families would sit in the comfort of their homes with their children who were coming to the institution and could ask the, the tourist guide um, questions, pause uh, and get information. And as I say, we then also had the schools online. And so this was one way of keeping the interaction together. The students had to learn very quickly how to work on a Zoom platform, to put together um, slide presentations and to be able to handle the entire thing. So when they left, they were upskilled and could deal with a COVID virtual tourism world. We then developed bubble tours. And this was when we went to, down to lockdown four. Bubble tours was something that we well, I kind of thought up in the middle of the night, where you would do tours with only four people. The tourist guide, the student would be masked and the four people would come from a bubble family. In other words, somebody who were people who were from one particular group. And then also individuals who came from the public could also join us. And so you would then have um, four to five people going on a tour with social distancing, staying outside of buildings, wearing masks, and of course, um, sanitizing their, their hands and entering campus, which is under strict control with temperatures being taken on accessing, etc. So our bubble tours were incredibly successful. And I'm delighted to say that my 2021 Platinum Group are carrying on with them um, this year as well. So there's just to give you an, an idea of what a bubble tour would look like. Your four guests distancing, walking with the tourist guide across campus and getting the experience. We then started thinking beyond what we usually did for the prospective student. And so that we started looking at what else did our campus have to offer. So COVID really jettisoned us into thinking again. And so we started looking at different themed tours that we could do. And on the same campus, you can now come and go on a garden tour and see the incredible beauty of our campus just through the eyes of nature. You can do it at the wee early morning, or you can do it at, 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 in the middle of the day if you want to take on the sun, or you can do it in the evening. And so the students developed these wonderful tours with our landscape architect, um, Jason Sampson, who gave them the lowdown and the stories of all the food, um, the food producing plants and the water harvest that we have on the campus. And then our university is actually one of the top 10 in the world in terms of its green um, um, uh, foot, uh, footprint rather. We also discovered that we had an aloe collection, not on our main campus, but actually down on our sports campus. And so the students went off there and learned all about these incredible plants and what they had to offer. And so we were able to then put together an aloe tour. 
But because the LOs only fire at a certain time of the year, the students then put together a virtual LO tour. So we could tap into a market where people would be sitting in the comfort of their homes, perhaps having a dinner party, and then inviting their students, the students to give them a tour while they sat with their friends in their homes having their dinner party. And then they would have an interactive tour and they could be asked questions while um, the guests were safely um, uh, social distancing in their own homes. Another tour that was brought onto the board was a sculpture tour where the students would focus specifically on incredible artworks that are dotted across our campus. And this was also something that everybody found very useful um, in, in the process. And then we had to look for a wider market. We had to go and have a look at who could we get on board. And so we started reaching out to the six alumni of which there are thousands out there and whether they would be interested in coming back to their campus either in a small bubble tour or whether they were overseas on a virtual tour and could see what had happened on their campus and visit their, their old neck of the woods. We also then started looking at our own staff and realized that so many staff did not really know their campus. They'd worked on the university forever. They went from their cars to the car park, to their offices, to the coffee shop, back to their offices, back to their homes. They didn't know about what was on on their campus. And so we started tapping into the, our own staff and then, of course, our student body as well. So on particular days throughout the year, students would also then be drawn in. And then this year, my students were very creative in that at International Museum Day, they took people on a virtual tour of all our museums and had scheduled tours, interactive tours um, on International Museums Day. They did the same with our Nelson Mandela Day, where they had 64 slides for 64 minutes as they took people through the campus um, as well. And then on Heritage Day coming up in September, they're again doing a tour in collaboration with one of my colleagues um, and the South African Heritage Resource Agency. So all of these ideas meant that we could then have a wider market and do more things. And then we even went as far as having a women's day tour where we saluted the women that were at the university and they took the, the, the um, visitors and guests through a tour of what, we, what wonderful women this university has produced going right back to 1908 and explained them through walking through the buildings and identifying those who had been in different faculties and different divisions at the institution. Sorry, my apologies. And then we had to think of innovative events. And I'm delighted to say that this year, in fact, this week, hot off the press, we were approached by our marketing division and uh, we were asked if we would put together an event because people don't want to come back to campus. Everybody's been in their pajamas for too long. They don't want to get up. They're going to work from home. How do you get people to come back to campus? And so they asked us to devise a corporate game, which we did. And we actually had our pilot on Monday and it was a roaring success. Here you can see the students have to devise, come up with ideas, they have to plan, they have to roll it out, um, they have to advertise. And so we came up with this wonderful idea of what we're calling the Tux um, Tour de Race, running across campus and doing a kind of a scavenger hunt. And when we did this on Monday, um, within one hour, these people had to go to 10 different destinations upon campus, there were riddles, um, and uh, riddles and rhymes to get them there. And then they had to do activities at a particular place. They had to take a selfie groupie photograph. And the, the first group back at the center of the um, university where we started were then the winners. But the fun that these people had, we randomized the group so that people had to get to know other people. And this is the kind of localizing. We're not even going beyond the borders of our, our university. And so this is gonna be rolled out to the rest of the campus where every department, every institution are going to book a scavenger hunt with my students they're going to pay. My students are going to have to process the whole process, and then they're going to get to experience their campus. And the feedback that we got on Monday was like, when's the next one? I want to do the next one. So it really is great and, and very successful. I also want to pause very briefly at this year's um, logo, which you'll see there on the screen, GLAM, which is galleries, gardens, libraries, archives, and museums. And this is an initiative which my students are presenting on, and I'm very delighted to say that we will be presenting um, at the end of the year at Atlas, and I will share the link with Alushka, where my honor students are going to be presenting about social prescribing. And this is to do with how you tap into another market. This is a medical term that predates COVID, but is very, very relevant under the COVID dispensation. And that is where people, because we've been clamped down, are taken out to do cultural and heritage activities to get out of the um, isolation that we've been in for so long. It's usually something for people who um, 
I need, um, uh, you know, mental and, and health well-being, but this has now been expanded. And we're now going to roll this out to our TICS alumni group of the 60 plus group um, and take our um, various guests to the galleries, to the gardens, to the libraries, to the archives and to the museums on campus. And if you'd like to look this up, it is actually an initiative from Oxford University that is taking this forward. So we've got to think innovatively, ladies and gents. We've got to think and realize that this is a time to look in a different direction. In fact, I remember doing International Tourist Guides Day for the National Department of Tourism in, in just before COVID in February 2019. And I said, we must not overlook our backyard. And little did I know, we were going to be forced into the backyard. And that is why I think there's so much to do. And that will then kickstart tourism. And then the international market will see what we're doing in our backyards and they'll wanna be in our backyards. Ladies and gents, if I may, Lushka, I'd just like to acknowledge my incredible group of postgraduate students who have walked a road for me. Some of them are in the industry and doing exceptionally well, but I'd like to acknowledge them for the hard work that they do. The click of a finger, the middle of the night, um, and they've done a number of, of, of um, projects with me. Um, we commissioned by the National of Tourism, as you're aware, to do work with them, and it's really led us down exciting pathways. So from my side, from a very warm and very sunny South Africa, I want to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I do hope that you found this enjoyable. As I always say, keep the tourist guide flag flying. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Harris. Um, once again, an amazing presentation. Um, just a quick refresher. What did um, GLAM stand for? Gardens? 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 A gallery, it's the G's, there's a double G, we added another G because we've got such beautiful gardens. So we've decided it's gardens and galleries. We have, as you know, the wonderful Mokongupu collection at our university and, and so on. So it's gardens, galleries, libraries, archives and museums. Fantastic, it was, uh, it was a very quick reference to it and we had a question in the chat. But okay. thank you so much for highlighting double, double tourism in trouble. Tourism will emerge with new focus and you've definitely highlighted some of those new focus points. So thank you so much for that. I think one of the other key takeaways was the making the unarconic iconic. And that's definitely where the role of the tourist guide will come in. I think we are so aware of what those anaconic uh, moments are in our given cities and destinations. So that is really something for us to think about and to focus on those potential little hidden gems, as they like to say. Um, so once again, Karen, thank you so much for your time. And then for all those uh, watching, if you have any questions for Karen, there will be a, she will be hosting a Q&A breakout room at the end of the conference. As I mentioned, we'll have four breakaway rooms with different themes. And Professor Harris will be hosting one of those for a Q&A session if you have anything further for her. So thank you so much, um, Karen. And then we hope that uh, we'll see you later in the Q&A session. Thanks. Thank you so much. And now moving on with our program, um, International Tourist Guide Day. What is this day? You've heard about it maybe, maybe you haven't. Um, it's a, it's a really the one day a year that is dedicated to us as the tourist guide and our profession. So I would like to introduce Sarah. Sarah is one of our executive board members and she'll be taking us through exactly what is International Tourist Guide Day and how can you get involved and when is the next one taking place? So Sarah, I hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alushka. And a very warm welcome also from my side. Alushka has already mentioned, my name is Sarah and I'm the co-opted secretary of the WFTGA. I'm very happy to be here with you today. And I think it goes without saying that the WFTGA is the world's largest organization for professional, qualified and accredited tourist guides. And there is a day when we commemorate the foundation of this federation about 35 years ago on the 21st February. And this is the International Tourist Guide Day Alushka has already mentioned. We can get one slide further, Sebastian, please. The International Tourist Guide Day was first inaugurated in 1990. And if I saw it correctly in the participants list, at least one person who had taken part at that day, more than 30 years ago now, is with us today. So warm greetings to you, Titina. <laughs> nice to have you back on board. 
yeah, every day, uh, every year on this or close to this day, so around the 21st February, we celebrate our profession. Members, member associations around the globe do it in different ways. Either they're going out together and celebrating each other, or they are training their fellow colleagues, or they are offering tours free of charge to the public in order to raise awareness for our profession. And maybe they also collect some money for some social organization. And believe me, every year, the amount of member associations taking part in this activity is growing. And this means that also globally, we are raising awareness for our profession. And this day is an incredibly good opportunity to establish public relations in your city or region. So why don't you join us? We've had, uh, or we have different themes each year. And normally it's linked to the UNWTO's theme for the World Tourism Day, which takes place on the 27th of September. And so it's actually in 12 days. And in the last years, for example, we have celebrated the following themes. Perfect, Sebastian, thank you. In 2021, it was tourist guides, contributors to rural tourism through creative storytelling. In 2020, we had tourist guides, contributors to sustainable tourism and jobs. In 2019, tourist guiding in the digital era becoming even more interesting nowadays or in the last couple of years. And in 2018, for example, Agents of Change, the tourist guide as an ambassador of change. And now we are thinking about 2022. And we would like to give you the choice to select one option among four to be the theme for 2021. So the next World International Tourist Guide Day uh, in, will take place in 2022 on the 21st of February, as every year. And you can celebrate it either on the day or around it with the events you would like to put forward in order to raise awareness in the public, throughout your inhabitants, or also in conjunction maybe with the tourism offices in your region. And we will do the poll through the Zoom tool. And now you can see the four options we are putting forward for you to choose from. So option one, for example, is inclusive growth, celebrating diversity in the tourist guide profession. And the reason for that is that the tourist guide profession prides itself for being very inclusive and diverse. And tourist guide associations around the world thrive on being multicultural, multicultural communities, and the WFTGA family embraces all. Option two is recovery and growth of tourism, the tourist guide's role. The reason being that the tourist guide plays an important role in tourism and it is important to utilize them in the reactivation to tourism in the destinations. Option three, inclusivity now more than ever, guiding people with special needs. Inclusivity allows for all to have equal opportunities and access, offering tours for those with special needs, demonstrates tourist guides are able to adapt. And option four, the tourist guides, we are the world. Through these demanding times, tourist guides must become even more relevant as ambassadors for the world. So we've compiled these four options for you to choose from in the poll in order to have this theme published throughout the next two weeks, also on our social media, and to be used for the International Tourist Guide Day 2022, 21st February. I can see that some are already putting their options in the chat. 
but we have prepared a poll for that. And Sebastian, if you would be so kind as to open it for everyone to choose from, that would be nice. Thank you. So I can see the first votes are going in. There should be a pop-up on your screen to click on the option you are preferring in order for us to have a final result. I think we'll wait a couple of seconds for that. 50 out of 122 I'll have voted. 60, 70, wow. Many people already are already used to Zoom polls, I guess. So that's very good. So we are close to 80 out of 120. Very nice. These are some interesting choices, Sarah. So I think people are giving it some thought because it's yes, not often they get to choose our theme for this, this special day. So I'm excited to see what the outcome will be. Yeah, me too. That's true. Yeah, we opened up this choice for us, for all of our members today, that uh, we could include you a bit more and also in order to have you maybe be a bit more linked to the International Tourist Guide Day so that you really are looking forward to celebrate it as well in your city or region. We have, we have a comment that it's really too hard to choose. So <laughs> I'm sure a few people are struggling, but think about how you, would, uh, how you would choose. And I think Sarah gave you some good examples of how you could use the theme towards uh, your profession as a tourist guide. So we're at 95 out of 125. So I think 15 more seconds. And okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, one, one comment is Good the one. button for all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is not the way democratic choices work. <laughs> so um, we wouldn't have a result then. Okay, very good. We have voted, I think 75% of all participants have voted for option two, recovery and growth of tourism, the tourist guide's role. Nice theme, I think, which we can use for the next year's International Tourist Guide Day. Thank you to all of you who have participated. And throughout the next couple of days, you will see that we yeah, publish our theme, the ones you also chose from now, the recovery and growth. And let us work together in order to make our profession more visible in, in the public. And we can use the International Tourist Guide Day 2022 very well for that. Thank you very much and um, hope to see you maybe in Serbia or on any other virtual conference in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And um, yes, we do have the hashtags and they were on the slides, but I'm sure the social media team will share, will share it with you in the chat shortly. Um, Sarah summarized our special day very well. So thank you for that, Sarah. And just to uh, reiterate, um, the chosen theme for 2022 International Tourist Guide Day, recovery and growth of tourism and the role that we play as tourist guides. And in the coming months, as the build up to this very special day, the 21st of February, we'll be sharing more information. And as always, we ask you as tourist guides to please involve your association members and get all the tourist guides involved with activities or whatever you choose to do and share it with us on our news email so that we can put it in our newsletter and share with all our members. So we look forward to, to hearing from all of you and what you have planned or will be planning for 2022. So speaking of February 2022, we have another big event coming up and that is our international convention. And to tell you more about our traditional conventions um, as well as our one for next year, I'll be handing over to my colleague and executive board member Manu and Sebastian. And the two of them will be explaining to you a bit more about our international convention before handing over to our hosts. So Manu, over to you. Thank you, Alushka, and a warm welcome and gratitude to all the tourist guides around the world who have graced your 
um, time with us. And we welcome you to our mini conference again on the part of the convention. And for this, I would like to introduce you about how really the convention happened in the past and how the convention will happen in the 2022. So with that, um, we would like to introduce to you that uh, WFTGA is a global family. So for we have association members with tourist guide members across the globe in over 100 countries. And for us to come together and meet in person is very important. And for the past quite longer months, we have been stuck inside our restrictions, even inside our homes. So that by 2022 of February, it will be a very good chance for us to meet in person. So with that, if I can have the next slide, please, Sebastian. So um, our international convention takes place every two years. This allow us to opportunity to connect with colleagues from over 50 countries and to use these opportunities to gain knowledge of the destination and the host country's culture, as well as, of course, to build friendship and network. The WFTJ conventions are made up of one convention, and in the program, we hold lectures, we hold workshops, we also do roundtables, we do panel discussions, and of course, we want you to explore and tour around in the local city and conduct our association business, which is to network and to build linkages. And at the same time, the location and as the biennial convention, the WFTGA holds its general assembly for delegates who represent our full member associations to discuss current matters, the relevant one, the updated queries, to vote for what would be the next location on our next convention, to also elect the officers who will be comprising the WFTGA executive board members, and of course, to attend to matters re relative to policies and procedures. These conventions also offer pre-convention and post-convention tour packages for the participants, delegates, and accompanying persons, so that at the end of the day, you can take away memories, meaningful memories. And also, this would allow the participants to further increase their opportunity to visit the host country and walk away as ambassadors. Historically, our convention started in 1985. So if we can have our next slide, Sebastian. Since 1985, we have been together. And you can see on the slide where we have been since, who our who were our hosts before. And this only proves that our conventions are global and that we travel to all continents, to all parts of the world. As of the moment, don't you see your city? So will it be the best time for you to encourage your association to become a member of the WFTGA or somehow think of bidding to be the next convention host? So with that, I think I have presented you the details of how convention before was and how convention will be in the future and the importance of this to all of us, the tourist guides as part of the WFTGA family. May I now um, transfer this over to Sebastian for him to introduce our host for the 2022 convention. Yeah, thanks Mano for the presentation of the past convention and what we are doing during conventions. And yeah, I'm proud to present the next host. I can remember it very well. We had been in Tbilisi and it's, yeah, it's coming for uh, the WFTGA that during a convention, the, the bidding countries for the next convention, they get on the stage, they present with videos, with theater shows, uh, whatever. And in Tbilisi, that had been um, Ivana and Milos from Serbia, and they did really a great presentation. And in the General Assembly, uh, the delegates then decided the next convention, 2021. Yeah, that was this year. This convention should be 
in Novi Sad in Serbia. But we all know it was COVID, it was the pandemic, and I think it was one of the best decisions to reschedule uh, the convention to the next year, to 2022. Now we all got uh, the vaccination, we all can travel again. It's now much easier, and during 2021, it would not be possible. So next year, it is um, Novi Sad, Serbia. The registration is already open. You got perhaps the link in the newsletter. And what's also uh, interesting behind the scene at the moment, we are discussing in the, um, uh, in the expo, who will be the next bidding countries, who can be the host the next convention 2024. And we will decide that again during the next convention in Serbia. But now it's time to hand over to Serbia, to not Ivana and Milos, they are not here, but they sent us their best girl in the team. And that is I Jovana. Hello to Novi Sad to Serbia. Hello, Sebastian. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for these wonderful presentations. Uh, as Sebastian said, I'm Jovana, not Ivana. It's quite similar. Uh, so, uh, in the name of the team, I would like to invite everyone to register for our convention in Novi Sad in February 2022. And we have prepared uh, a video uh, for you uh, to see uh, what it's like to be in the winter in Novi Sad and holidays, uh, to see what to expect. Uh, and uh, just to tell you, early bird is already getting full, so you need to register re really quickly. Uh, and for all your questions, I will leave uh, in the chat email address where you can write or you can write uh, on any of the emails about our convention. And we are happy, of course, to welcome you in a novice in 2022 in February. So Sebastian, if you can please play our video.
Thank you, Ivana. And um, that music, is that um, traditional Serbian music that we were hearing? Uh, yes, it is traditional uh, Serbian music, actually uh, more from Vojvodina. Uh, so you will hear it uh, when you come to our convention. Uh, and I just want uh, to say, because we had a lot of questions uh, during previous events and so on that uh, do we have snow in Serbia and in Novi Sad during winter? So I hope that this video answered all your questions. Uh, all photos that you could see are from our pre and post convention tour, uh, of course, uh, from Novi Sad also. Uh, so I hope that you have enjoyed. I have followed some of the comments. Uh, so once again, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask us and to write to our email. Great, and um, I know the expo visited Serbia in October 2019, and I can say the food was absolutely delicious. I saw some comments in the chat about the dessert. Yes, come hungry. Um, come hungry. Come hungry. Uh, you will, you will exactly. enjoy the food. Uh, for everyone's taste, we have something. So uh, I know that you will not uh, stay hungry. Uh, maybe a few kilos uh, more <laughs> when you come back uh, to your home. But I'm sure that you will enjoy our, our event. And we are preparing so much for you. And we are working nonstop on registration, on everything. Uh, so just feel free to, to write and, of course, register. And we are waiting for you in Avisad. Absolutely. And thank you so much for that. And of course, another very big thing we are all looking forward to is the announcement in, at the Serbian Convention as, as to who will host the 20th WFTGA Convention yes, in 2024. We are all waiting for that to see so, who will be the next yeah. host. <laughs> Perfect. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, and team. Thank you. All right, so now moving on to our next point, I have great pleasure to introduce to you Eric uh, from the World Food Travel Association. Eric is the founder and executive director, and he obviously has a passion for the food travel trade industry and also is one of our strategic partners. So I'd like to hand over to Eric. He, has, he will only be with us a couple of minutes, but he has some interesting things on the horizon to share with us from the World Food Travel Association. Uh, welcome, Eric, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Alushka. It's great to be here, everyone. Um, can I? Uh, sh oh, I can share my screen. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So let me just um, go here and get my presentation ready. Okay. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, to thank Alushka for the opportunity to be here. Um, she is one of our favorite partners <laughs> in the world. Uh, she and I have these, these ongoing conversations that get quite funny, and she's just a lot of fun to work with. But more importantly, we're a really good fit for each other. We have been working as a strategic partner with the WFTGA now for a couple of years, and we really respect each other's work. I mean, we really like what the association does, what you stand for, the professionalism, um, and we feel the exact same way about what we do. So we really value our partnership and thank you to Alushka and her team for continuing to support us in the things that we do. So um, the first thing that uh, I don't know if you all know who we are, but um, I founded the organization back in 2001. I wrote a white paper. Um, World Food Travel Association, we lead by innovation. Everything we do is bringing firsts to our industry, whether it's education and training and handbooks or a, a TV talk show or a podcast. We've innovated with all of these things for the culinary tourism industry. And what's the future hold for us? Well, it's going to be more innovation and diversity and reinvention and creativity and more thought leadership. What do we do? We do a lot of things. So I mentioned our training. Um, we have a, our recognition, our awards, our culinary capitals. We do consulting work. We have a, a fantastic engaged community. We, we do a lot. 
and who have we worked with? These are some of the names around the world who have trusted us in varying capacities, whether it's a destination strategy or training for their people or whoever. So I'm sure you recognize some of the, the big names out there. We work with destinations um, and businesses, both big and small. And who else do we partner with? Well, besides the WFTGA, uh, there's the National Tour Association in the US, World Travel Market, uh, the UN's Global Tourism Plastics Initiative, uh, Traveling Spoon, World Gourmet Society, you name it. We work with a lot of organizations around the world. And for the WFTGA, we offer culinary tourist guide certification and training. So we developed a special program for the WFTGA guides. And for anyone who is on the in the meeting today who's not a WFTGA member, that's okay. We also offer training for you. But to get the certification, you have to be a professional tourist guide. And if you are a WFTGA member, you get a special price and you get a very nice discount. But if you go to the um, URL in the upper right there, academy.worldfoodtravel.org, that will show you our training options. So whether you need the culinary tourist guide training, you know, you're new to the profession and you're not quite ready to be a certified, or if you um, just need the, um, the, you know, the, the masterclass or, or if you need the certification you have different options available. Um, now we also have our food trucks summits and we have one coming up. Well, we actually have three coming up this, uh, this quarter. We have our research summit, our innovation summit and food trucks North America. So if any of you are uh, either looking to do an event online to increase your learning with, about the association or um, the industry, things that, that are affecting like accessibility is one of the topics we're going to be talking about at the innovation summit. This is where you would go, uh, worldfoodtravel.org. And we do have scholarships available. We are offering up to 10 scholarships for our innovation summit this year. Go to the donate now button and at the bottom of our homepage. And on that page, you'll see a link to apply for scholarships. And then of course, our Food Travel Talk TV, Alushka was our guest last May on this. And if you go to our website and you go to TV podcast, you can find the link there and you can lis listen to uh, Alushka's interview. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to tell you about was our GastroTerra community, where this is where all of our community comes together, where your tourist guides or tour operators, um, destination marketers, academics, researchers, you name it. And you can go there to members.worldfoodtravel.org and it is free to sign up. So we hope to see you over there. Join the culinary tours group, participate, learn from others, ask questions, and it's just a great place to network. So Alushka, thank you again for the opportunity to see everyone. I, unfortunately, I won't be in Novi Sad. My web developer lives in Novi Sad and he um, is always eating something in our meetings. And he shows me, and he had these pastry things and, and he said, yeah, well, the problem with our food is it's so good that you actually, you end up putting on weight. And I said, well, that's not a place I could live, unfortunately, but maybe I could visit for a few days. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Eric. Even visiting for a few days will pile on the kilos. I can I can guarantee you that. Um, so th <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you for your kind words in the Pleasure. intro. Um, it's always lovely having you on board. And as you mentioned, more innovation, transformation completely speaks to our path as an international association. So lovely synergy between the two of us. So fantastic. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I know that there are some of the members attending today who are actually part of your culinary family. Um, me included, um, the culinary world has really opened up. Um, I think UNWTO recently had their, uh, their sort of wine tourism um, event as well, which was very well attended. Um, so really a big, a big space opening up in the tourist guiding field for being a bit more focused on the culinary side of things in our destinations. So um, thank you for those opportunities you presented and um, yeah, we look forward to what the future holds. We do too. Thank you, Alushka. Thank you, Eric. Great. And um, wow, one and a half hours has absolutely flown by. We still have some time on our side. So with that, let's introduce what will happen next. Um, so we've opened up some breakout rooms um, because we really felt and we heard from our members that they would like to have a little bit more of a connection with one another and discuss a few interesting topics. So we have our four rooms available. We have online guided tours as one of the topics. Um, this is really being met with mixed feelings across the board from tourist guides. So it will really be interesting if you would like to discuss this. What are your views? What are your thoughts? And get some um, interesting interaction going. Yes. Okay, great. 
All right, so um, we will share the link to join the room shortly. Um, let's recap what your options are. Um, so we have the online guided tours um, that will be uh, run by Marika. We also then have room two, which is how your association has evolved during the COVID years. The last COVID year, um, that will be run by Sarah, we met earlier. Room three will be the Q&A with Professor Harris. Um, so use the opportunity to pick her brain. And then room four, we have what have you personally been doing to get through the COVID year? And that will be run by Manu, our executive board member as well. Um, so let's hope everyone has managed to log in again. Um, Sebastian, would you like to explain how they can join these um, breakaway rooms? Yes, just click on the on the link in the chat. So I send it once again in the chat. And oh no, is it here? Here, here we go. And um, when you click on that link, you will automatically come to the other meeting. We wait there five minutes until everybody is there. And then we start the breakout rooms. And in that meeting, it's very easy to, it will pop up which breakout room you want to choose. And then you are sent to the uh, special breakout room. Perfect. So before we do that, I think let's just take a few minutes to close our, our mini virtual conference and say our thanks. Um, and then we can move into those breakout rooms. So um, with that, let me just please use the opportunity to say thank you to all of you attending and for your support um, as tourist guides to attend our mini virtual conference. As always, we appreciate the support from our members and tourist guides. Um, I see some members in the chat room as well who've, who've joined us. And of course, our president emeritus, Tatina, we acknowledge as well. So thank you, Tatina, for joining us. And of course, some of our delegates who are the presidents and chairs of our association members. And then also behind the scenes, there are so many people involved to make things happen. Our WFTJ family is always there to support and assist. So Sebastian and your technical team, I think it's just you today, but thank you very much. Um, to our executive board members, Manu and Sarah, our social media team, who you would have seen online, um, Marilise and Patricia, and then of course our admin support team, Sonia as well. And then our executive board members who were not able to attend today were Jean, Vahola, Herman, um, also thank you to them. And then our presenters, Eric and Professor Harris, we always enjoy your contributions as well. So for today, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you at our next virtual session, which will actually be our association journeys again. They were quite successful at the end of last year and we'll be running again three dates in October. So for those dates and times, follow our social media pages and that is where our association members present on what they've managed to achieve in the last year. So from all of us, thank you very much. We will see you shortly in the breakout rooms. Please use the link um, and goodbye and thank you very much. Uh, room number one, we were very active, very enthusiastic guides. And we spoke about the advantages and disadvantages of uh, leading online guided tours as well to in-person tours. So some of the key words we had like, um, you know, reach across borders or something, you know, that online guided tours provided. And um, we have some as to the, the connections, but a lot of challenges and some had backup support. They were, they had backup support when they do online guided tours outside, which not many of us have. There's a lot of possibilities for foreign and domestic. And there, sometimes internet is not good, you know, so it, it falls, it breaks. So what do we do? There are, it's a lot of them are giving complimentary tours, but it is tip based. So they like that people give tips online, which is part of the thing, unless some get a salary. And some said it's an opportunity for domestic tourism or engagement. Engagement is limited. Maybe Hanye, would you like to give some more that I missed, Hanye? Hanye was helping me in summarizing. Uh, oh, Marika, you are great. You mentioned uh, almost everything, but one of the advantages of online tours that we mentioned was uh, that 
there is no time limitation or age limitation for the participants if a, a family it couldn't uh, just travel together before the pandemic now the 80 year old grandmother can travel with her small kids and small grandchildren right i i now something comes to mind which is very interesting one of the participants from the philippines ramon said he was doing a thesis on uh, people with special needs like uh, uh, autism, autistic visitors who are watching the tour, who are going to online guided tours. How does the guide deal with autistic audience or even post-traumatic uh, disorder? Because sometimes they are part of the audience. So he's doing a study. And I think that that belongs to a larger conversation that we can discuss in the future. It is a very hot topic today. It is the way forward, 2022 and beyond online guided tours. So stay tuned, everyone. Thank you, Marika, for this sum up. Yeah, and the WFDGA definitely uh, will follow this topic. So we have, uh, we have offered a course uh, for trainers, online guided tours, we will definitely talk about that uh, during the next convention in Serbia. Um, I think there will be one workshop about virtual or online guided tours, what's the different, what's, what the technical needs are and so on. So this is definitely a topic we will follow in the next month. So thank you, Marika, for uh, hosting group number one. We are coming to group number two. <laughs> this was Sarah. That was me, exactly, Sebastian. Thank you. In room number two, we were talking about the challenges the last couple of months with the pandemic uh, post to associations in special. And it turned out that many of us are not only volunteering in one single, <clears throat> sorry, in one single association, but in several ones. So giving a lot of time to associations without being paid for it, because we believe in the, in the aim of that certain association. <clears throat> and, and we've got very different stories from the last couple of months, I must admit. So from our individual member from Antigua, for example, from the Caribbean, uh, who's still struggling with the help of the WFTGA to form an association, a regional association of tourist guides, not only Antigua, but with different Caribbean islands. And she's uh, very, very engaged and committed to that. So I was very happy to see that. But uh, on the other hand, we had, for example, our member from Costa Rica, who have lost quite a lot of um, quite some tourist guides during the last months due to the pandemic, but also due to the economic situation. Whereas, for example, in Portugal, our association was even able to gain new members to their association with different activities which they did during the, let's say, standstill and the lockdown. But what was really amazing and what I was really impressing in my opinion was that all of the associations or individual members were not standing still and trying to do nothing but there was like from training our tourist guides for the next steps for example in online guided tours during the time when they were not able to perform in in-person tours or to give them other new capabilities, uh, for example, to search for jobs during winter as well, which they could now also use due to during the pandemic times when there were no tours possible. Also to associations who gave psychological help to their tourist guides due to the large challenges and um, let's say mental charge they had during the pandemic, not being able to work and maybe losing family members or friends and relatives. So I was really impressed that there are still so many people around the globe working voluntarily if they believe in the aim, and I hope all of us do that. 
And from Iran, for example, we had the insight that we need to invest some time and maybe, yeah, um, not get paid for that in order to market either the association or the country in order to be repaid later on. And this is, of course, always a difficult calculation because you cannot put the marketing weight to direct results. But I saw a lot of positivity also in the associations which took part in our room. So I'm really happy to be part of this family. And I think all of us will go into a better future. And so we will stay safe and active as tourist guides around the world. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, that was the final closer words, I would say. <laughs> no, but uh, we still have two more groups. Um, so is there Karen? Yeah, I see her from group number three, our professor. What had been the question and your answers in your session? Well, we had a wonderful um, grouping together, people from across the, the globe, which was really nice. Some people I'd met in Tbilisi and other people who were new friends to meet. And we were just talking about, um, amongst others, you know, using the university um, as an example and how this could be rolled out to different institutions. Um, and, and, you know, whether other universities in our country also have followed this lead and how important using the students and giving them this, this um, training, um, like sort of an internship um, at the university was very, very important. Um, and then our, our friend from Florence, Laura, was, was talking about the, um, the restrictions of, of, of tourist guiding and how this prohibits people to get involved, you know, and, and the training and so on. And, and I said, well, you know, COVID is probably the time now to lobby for these things that governments have to rethink because, you know, we have this, this, this dual band, as it were, where, you know, certain tourist guides are trained, regulated and restricted in other countries. It's not like that. And so... Um, one of the um, the American um, participants was saying about how people, you know, her daughter had become a tourist guide sort of overnight, and and the, and the lady from Florence was saying, well, that wouldn't happen in Italy, and and how we need to actually use this time now to also lobby governments and say to them, look, you want this tourism to work for you, you want it to contribute to your GDP, then you need to do the following. And I know, you know, in in many of the discussions and, and papers I've given over the years, is the tourist guide is always seen as the bottom feeder, um, but the tourist guide is actually the person who makes the difference um, and therefore you know we need to get that acknowledgement and we need to use COVID so COVID in a, in a way is, is an awful thing but we can also use it to our advantage that governments need to wake up and and as, as, as the lady from Florence was saying we can't go back to the past we have to look to a new future and we've got to reconfigure that and so that whole she was commenting on that you know the R factor reconfigure reinvigorate reinvent you know reconstruct you can go on and on forever um, and then PG was saying you know um, from, from the Philippines were looking at their situation and also how online work there and how what you were saying earlier, the difference between the online and, and um, virtual tours and how they work and so on. So that's a fascinating topic as well. So yes, it, it, we, we, we ran out of time. <laughs> it was really wonderful. But thanks, Sebastian. I, I don't think I've spoken enough today. You heard enough from me. So thank you. We love to listen to you. Thank you for your time, also for the long time you have been here in the webinar, first your presentation, also the Q&A section. This is not normal for a lot of speakers to stay so long with us. So we, we realize you are in the heart a real tourist guide. So perhaps you want to start guiding again for us in South Africa or in other countries too. But yeah, that, that's definitely what you said. Um, we have a lot to do. Yeah, And um, uh, we hear a lot of the same from all politicians, you tourist guides are so important, but at the end, what they're really doing for us uh, and how, how they are paying us or how they treat us, there's a big difference and perhaps something can change in uh, or has changed during the pandemic. So we are coming to the last group and that was Manu. Manu, are you still here? I have to check. I don't see you any, has, perhaps he has left the audience already. So I was also a little bit in this group and I can say it had been a lot of topics coming up what everybody did during uh, the pandemic time. A lot of trained a lot, a lot of founded new companies, a lot of helped other tourist guides. And yeah, I think it's great 
to be here in the big um, uh, group of tourist guides. That's what we always feel when we are coming together, that we have the same waves that we support us others uh, than in other uh, yeah, groups. I have been in different groups in the last year and I realize uh, the best is um, yeah here uh, in the tourist guides group. I love the conventions when we all stand together and sing the amazing songs and you really can feel that we are, are a big group. And yeah, these are my final words uh, for everybody here. Um, thank you for joining us in this mini virtual conference like uh, Alushka said before, we will uh, cut the recording together, we will put it online the next days. Um, there will be a few meetings uh, in the future, always check our website, our social media channels. Um, I know that in the autumn we will do, we will have, um, uh, first of all, here we have the board for those uh, can't remember everybody from the board. Not everybody was today with us. Gene is still struggling in the US with the uh, with the hurricane and the rest. He said he can't join today because he has internet problems and all of that. Um, Viola had work today with a training matter. So, but you know, all Viola is very very active. We have our social media girls. She was also in the uh, the chat here and. Um, during the conference, putting Instagram reels, use please use our hashtags, um, and you can see Herman, our treasurer, uh, who is always in the back and uh, is looking into our finances. And yeah, what is uh, the future or what is the next? Uh, we will do a few talks about what the associations, what their journey was during the pandemic. We had nine webinars last year, starting in October, November, and in this year about what the uh, associations have done. And this is really amazing because you see best practice, what others are doing, what in Portugal is going on, how do they support their uh, tourist guides, what have New York has done. And that was really amazing to look into that uh, other yeah, associations. And I can really recommend that we will have three meetings in October, um, the association's journeys 2021. Then there will be the World Food Travel Association's meeting. We will have, sure, the uh, 21 February. And there is the um, World Travel Market meeting in London, um, where WFDGA is partner. And yeah, that's it. We have a lot of partners. And that's one of the last things Alushka already mentioned. If you want to become an affiliate uh, partner of us, if you have a uh, tour company or if you have a training center, you can, can become an affiliate partner of us. You can become an individual member if you have no association in your region or perhaps you want to find an association, we will help you and um, you can write an email to our membership email address and then we help you. Yeah, a few just more uh, dates which will come up in the next uh, month. You will find everything on the website. Please give us feedback what we can do better on Facebook, on Instagram, on the website or on our YouTube channel. Um, we are all volunteers on the board and we really need the help of the tourist guides. Um, be, and what we also need is uh, a lot of good new candidates for the next board. I'm allowed to say that we have elections next year in February in Novi Sad. And so please ask around in your associations uh, who will help us in the board in the next um, yeah, two years. And that's the final ending. Um, WFDGA, please join us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube, and have a nice evening. We will close the session, not really, so just we from the hosts, we will uh, leave uh, uh, this meeting now, but you can stay here. You can talk if you want to with each other. We will leave that open, just open topic talk here um, with your friends, with your tourist guides. But for all the others, stay safe and perhaps we meet in Serbia. That would be really great if we all come together in Serbia or during one of our next tea chats, virtual meetings and so on. So thanks everybody. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Bye, everybody. Stay well. She, she. You too. Okay, bye, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye, everyone. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Hopefully, we'll see you all yeah. in Serbia. Bye. 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 Nice seeing you again, bye. Michael. Yes, Deborah. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye. Okay, bye. Trust me. See you all tomorrow. Yeah.